Hi everybody, welcome back. This is Unit 3B Review. Just a heads up, this is going to be a long one, so feel free to skip around as you need. So this is going to cover the 3B practice test that you guys have access to. So question number one says, compared to H2S, the higher boiling point of H2O is due to the... Now at this point of the year, if you see words like molarity or gram for more than S, we haven't talked about those, so don't start inventing new things during the test. Then we're talking about molecular size of water, hydrogen bonding of water. So the answer is going to be B. And if you remember, hydrogen bond, again, it's not really a bond. It's the attraction of an H of one molecule and the F, O, or N of another. So I like to say hydrogen bonding is F, O, N, fun. So if you have a whole bunch of H2O molecules, you have that H, you have that O, that is hydrogen bonding. Now you'll notice in H2S, S is not F, O, or N. So that's why hydrogen bonding is the answer. Okay, number two, hydrogen bonding is a type of, it's a type of intermolecular force, or INF. Remember, it's the attraction between different molecules. So it is not a covalent bond. It is not an ionic bond. It is not a bond. That is the most important thing you need to remember. Hydrogen bonding is not a bond. So now we're left between strong intermolecular force or weak intermolecular force. It is strong. So if you think about it, hydrogen bonding is the thing that holds your DNA together. That is the thing that allows little water bugs to float on top of water. That <clears throat> has a bunch of different applications. And if you think about it in terms of different questions, that's what gives specific compounds um, unusually high boiling and melting points. So it's a strong intermolecular force. Okay, number three. Says so the boiling point at standard pressure of four compounds are given in the table below, but really to the side. Which type of attraction can be used to explain the unusually high boiling point of water? So even without this table, it's telling you that H2O has an unusually high boiling point. But it's given you in a table. So here you have H2O with 100 degrees Celsius. And then these three, which have a much, much, much considerably lower boiling point. Now, you'll notice, if you remember, your H bond, and again, quote unquote bond, is F O and fun, it's F, O, R, N. These compounds don't have that, but H2O has that oxygen, therefore, again, it is that hydrogen bonding. So again, hydrogen bonding, not a bond. It's a strong intermolecular force that causes things to have unusually high boiling and melting points. Okay, so number four says, which diagram best illustrates the hydration of sodium ions in aqueous solution? Basically, it's just saying, if you were to put salt into water, how does it react? So remember, salt is sodium chloride, or the sodium chloride is what they're talking about, but it's just talking about the sodium ion. Remember, sodium is positive. And if you remember, let me do a different color here. When you're drawing your water, H is a little, uh, oxygen is a little bit negative, H is a little bit positive. So the ion will break apart. So that's where we have these NO plus. And again, it's how will that water molecule interact with it. And the oxygen is going to want to point its way towards sodium. Remember, opposites attract. So this question assumes that you remember this, that oxygen is partially negative, hydrogen is partially positive. Opposites attract, so therefore it is E. And that's really how all of the intermolecular forces work. Okay, number five. So it's given the reaction, the equation representing the reaction, H plus H, H plus H gives you H2, which statement describes the energy change. So if we're talking about energy and reactions, there's a four-letter word you should be thinking of, and it is BARF. So what BARF stands for is break, absorb, release, four. So this unit is full of four letter acronyms and here is one of them. Break, absorb, release, form. So what this says is when you break a bond, energy needs to be absorbed. When you form a bond, energy needs to be released. So 
go back to the first video of this unit for more examples of this. But here we have H and H separately coming together. So a bond is going to be a bond is going to be formed. Therefore, energy is released. So we can get rid of A and B. Formed, released, that is D. If it was the opposite way around, if it said H2, BH plus H, that is breaking a bond, and therefore absorb. Okay, so remember, just remember both. Number six, we have given the structure for the word ethyne. Now at this point, you guys don't know what ethyne is, but when we get to the organic chem unit, you will. And so it says how many total electrons is shared between the two carbon atoms. So here we're just talking about this. So we have C, three lines, and a C. Now when these questions come up, sometimes they'll say total electrons, sometimes they say pairs. You have to read the question carefully because they could look the same, but that one word could be changed. So if you have three lines, that is a triple bond. And so a triple bond is three pairs of electrons shared and six total electrons. And again, our question is asking for a total number of electrons. So our total number is six. You can also think of each line. Connect each line represents two dots. So if you think about it like connecting the dots, you have your six electrons. Three pairs, six electrons total. Okay, number seven. This is what type of bond exists in a molecule of high nitrogen iodine. So here we're talking, it's telling you it's covalent, but we want to figure out if it's polar or not polar. So we have to use our trusty friend table I. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.2. Iodine has an electronegativity of Looking on table I right now. Looking, 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 oh, I found it. 2.7. So if you do calculate your relative negativity difference, it's big number and minus small number. So big minus small, you get 2.7 minus 2.2, which gives you 0 0.5. So if you remember, anything from 0 to 0.4, that is your non-polar bond. And then anything bigger than 0.4, again, with uh, all not metals, that is your polar bond. So, because we have 0.5, it is going to be a polar covalent bond. And we have the electronegativity difference between 0 and 0.17. So it's not equal to 0, that's why it is not A. This, the answer choices are a little, we're worried a bit weird, but just thinking about it, that is what you need to do. Okay, number eight says so a molecular compound is formed when a chemical reaction occurs between atoms of. So here, the key word here is molecular compound. You should be thinking covalent bond. Remember that is a non-metal plus a non-metal. So if you go through this, oxygen and hydrogen are non-metals. Everything else is either a metal and a non-metal. So the only tricky part here is this element, but if you look on your periodic table, you'll find that it is a transition metal. But you know oxygen and hydrogen are both non-metal, so that one's there. But again, key point, molecular compound means covalent bond. Okay, number nine, the chemical bonding in sodium phosphate is classified as. So here, when you have a kind of complicated looking formula, your first thing should be to check table E. So table E has your polyatomic ions. So in this specific example, PO4 comes directly from table E. So right here, this is held together by a different color, by covalent bonds, but it has a charge. PO4 has a negative three charge, and so what holds the positive sodium and then the negative polyatomic ion is your ionic bond. So, oops, what holds this together right there is your ionic, but what holds PO4 together is covalent. So, C, covalent and ionic. 
again, if whatever, if Chad's left this, if a question is asking about this with a complicated formula, it will be covalent and ionic. Just double check table E. Those are your polyatomic ions. Okay. Number 10. This is given the formula of a substance. What is the total number of electrons shared? So we're talking about electrons in this molecule of this substance. So remember, every line equals two electrons. So we have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. So we have 22 total electrons. That means we have 11 pairs. So again, this specific question is asking for electrons. It may ask you for pairs. Read the question carefully. Number 11. So this is a bond between hydrogen atom and a sulfur atom is formed. Electrons are. So hydrogen is your nonmetal. Sulfur is also a nonmetal. So we know nonmetal plus nonmetal equals covalent. Now in a covalent form, it's asking about what happens to electrons. In a covalent bond, electrons are shared. So share to form a covalent bond like that. Remember, ionic is a metal and a nonmetal with electrons transferred. Covalent, two nonmetals, electrons are shared. Okay, so number 12 says which atom, which pair of atoms has the most polar bond? So here you need to use table S and calculate the electronegativity difference for each of these. So if you look at N, H, B, R, H is 2.2. BR is, where is it? BR is 3.0. Okay, it is 3.0. So that difference is 0 0.8. If you look at H and CL, H is 2.2. Cl is 3.2, so your electronegativity difference is 1.0. Uh, spoiler alert, that is the answer. If you want to continue doing the other ones, uh, you can. So again, you're just calculating the electronegativity difference, so it's the big number minus the small number. And the bigger the difference, the more polar the bond is. The smaller the number, the least polar bond is. Okay, so number 13 says which formula represents a nonpolar molecule containing polar bonds. So if your molecule is nonpolar, remember that is where SNAP comes into play. SNAP talks about your molecules and that means symmetrical, nonpolar, asymmetrical, polar. So a nonpolar molecule means you have to be symmetrical, meaning if you cut it in half four ways, you it's the same. So that narrows it down to A and B, but then you also need polar covalent bonds, and that means your E and D, your electronegativity difference, is bigger than 0.4. If you look at the electronegativity difference for H and H, it's zero, your bond electronegativity difference, because it's the same thing. Between O and C, it's bigger than 0.4. So that's why the answer is B. Again, you can be a nonpolar molecule with polar covalent bonds. Okay. 14 says which two atoms have the greatest uh, degree of polarity. So that means which one has the biggest bond electronegativity difference. And if you were to go and calculate this, C and C is 0, C and H is 0 0.4. Those I just know off the top of my head. If we look at the other ones, carbon is 2.6, O is 3.4, and H is 2.2. So if you get 3.4 minus 2.6 and 3.4 minus 2.2, you get the bigger number here. So that's why it is D. So the bigger the difference, the more polar a bond is, the greater degree of polarity there is. 
Number 15 says which electron dot diagram represents a molecule that has a polar covalent bond. So polar covalent, the electrons are shared unevenly. So B and D show these are ionic bonds because you have those ions. So here we have we're between A and C. So A shows your polar bond because the electrons are shared unevenly. C shows you a nonpolar because the electrons are shared evenly. So here is even, here is uneven. A is our answer. Okay, um, number 16 says which statement describes the charge distribution and the polarity of a CH4 molecule? So um, before you even look at the answer choices, CH might help if you draw it. CH4 looks like this. So here you can maybe tell it is symmetrical. So it passes what we call the four line test. So the charge distribution is symmetrical. Oh, so we can, it can be A or B. And because of snap, if you have a symmetrical distribution or a symmetrical molecule that is nonpolar, so that makes it A. Uh, symmetrical charge distribution and a nonpolar molecule. Okay, uh, 17 says which form, uh, formula represents a polar molecule. Again, that is going to be your asymmetric polar molecule. So O2 looks like this. That's pretty symmetrical. CO2 looks like this. That's pretty symmetrical. NH3 looks like that. That is not symmetrical. And CH4 looks like this. So knowing what they look like is important. And then just run it through the four line test. So O2, if you cut it in the in have four different ways to get the same thing every single time that is nonpolar, same thing with this, nonpolar, same thing with that, nonpolar. But if you cut it NH3 like in half that way, it's the same. But if you cut it in half the other way, it does it is not the same, therefore it is polar. Therefore C is your answer choice. Number 17, I mean number 18, sorry, says which polyatomic ion is found in the compound represented by the formula NaHCO3. So if we're talking about polyatomic ions, you should go to table E. Once you arrive at table E, you should be like, okay, cool, what part of that compound matches exactly on table E? And when you do that, you will see that HCO3 matches, and HCO3 is named hydrogen carbonate, and so therefore the answer is B. So that just comes straight off table E, and looking to see what matches, it is there. Do not guess. That's a silly question to get wrong, because it's right in front of you, should you look. Okay, number 19 says, why is CO2 nonpolar? Why is the molecule nonpolar? So again, it's telling you it is nonpolar. And so you need to think of SNAP. And that means symmetrical distribution, symmetrical shape. Therefore, it is C. So sometimes it might help just looking, figuring out the question first, and then looking at the answers, especially if they are kind of long and annoying. Okay, number 20, which compounds contain both ionic and covalent? Whenever you see both ionic and covalent, you should be thinking polyatomic ions, and that means you should be looking at table E. So now, looking at table E, which one of these compounds has something that matches? The answer is A, CO3 is on table E, so therefore that is that polyatomic ion. So again, CO3 is held together by covalent bonds, and then CO3 because it has a charge bonds ionically to calcium.
Okay. Number 21 says represents a form of butanamide. And at this point, you don't know what that means, but you will when we get to organic. Um, but it says, in terms of charge distribution, why a molecule is polar. So it's telling you it's polar. And then it says, in terms of charge distribution. So charge distribution, that, those words need to be in your answer. So you, all you need to say is the charge distribution is, so if we're talking about polar, again, oops, S N A P is asymmetric. You could also say it is uneven, an uneven distribution. So either of those things mean the same thing. Uneven distribution, asymmetric distribution, that is polar as a molecule. 22 says a bunch of random info. Compare the strength of attraction for electrons. So this definition right here is the definition of electronegativity. By hydrogen to the strength of attraction of electrons by an oxygen atom within a water molecule. So basically the question is saying, which is more electronegative, oxygen or hydrogen? All you have to say, oxygen is more electronegative. If you wrote, I'm gonna abbreviate that, hydrogen is less electronegative, that is fine too. Okay, you don't need to explain, it just says compare. Now, if you used the term attraction for electron instead of electronegativity, that is fine as well. So if you wrote um, H has a less a smaller attraction for electrons and O has a bigger attraction, that is fine. Okay, number three, say, uh, 23 rather, um, the bound equation, blah, 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 blah. Explain in terms of bonds, why energy is being absorbed. So when we're talking about we're talking about bonds and energy. You should be thinking barf, break, absorb, release, formed. So it's telling you energy is being absorbed. So it's literally telling you here. Look at this part of it. Um, in terms of bond, so a bond is broken, and that is all you need. So when energy is absorbed, that means a bond is being broken. That is it. Do, when it comes to short answer questions, you don't need to write an essay. You don't need to restate. Answer it in as few words as you can. Again, it says in terms of bonds, so that's why we need to talk about bond. Okay, almost done here. Uh, 24 gives us a lovely paragraph about baking muffins. Guess what? Who cares? Doesn't matter. All that matters, it says based on table E, identify the polyatomic ion in the solid product of the reaction. So. Uh, everything before the arrow, these are your reactants. Everything after the arrow, those are your products. So of those products, which of them is a solid? The answer is right here. And then it says, okay, based on table E, what polyatomic ion is in that formula? You could have said CO3 just like that, or you could have written carbonate. Either the formula or the name would have been fine. If you wrote CO3 with a negative 2 charge, that is also fine. Anything like that. So it's literally just asking for what that is. No need to overcomplicate it. Okay. 25, the last question says identify a type of strong intermolecular force that exists between water molecules but does not exist between carbon dioxide molecules. And the answer is hydrogen bond. Remember, side note. Hydrogen bonds, not actually a bond. It's a strong intermolecular force between the H and the F, O, or N of a different molecule. CO2 does not have the H, therefore it cannot hydrogen bond, um, but water does. So if you think about it, here is your water molecule. So the oxygen is going to be near the... Um, Negative oxygen is going to be near the positive H's of a different one. And so that attraction right there, that is your hydrogen quote unquote bond. Okay. So that is it. I know that was long, that was a lot. Feel free to watch this over as many times as you need. Go back to the YouTube channel and watch it 
the lecture videos for each different topic as many times as you need. Good luck.